Hello and welcome to the conference call for Sugar Free, how sweet it is. And really glad to have the opportunity today to speak with you. And um, evidently it was really hard for some people to get on the call today. So what I'm doing is I'm just gonna go ahead and record what I was going to say and make it available for you as a recording. So I want, first of all, I wanted to thank all the people who support the Sugar Free Group. I really love the fact that we can interact on this topic. It's really important to me and I'm hoping that it's also really important to you and that you are really seeing the importance of putting together a plan for making a difference in your life nutritionally. So what I wanted to do today is two things. First of all, I want to talk about why I'm here. Why am I on this call recording this right now for you? And secondly, why I think you wanted to be here. We did have some people that wanted to be here, but for whatever reasons were unable to make it. And so I want to address those two topics and then I want to give you a little homework because that's just what I do. I always give homework. So here's, first of all, I just want to tell you my story. Um, the reason I'm here is because of what's happened to me over the last six years and what I hope to help you prevent in your life from happening to you and the awakening that happened with me that brought me to where I am. First of all, um, my name is Bonnie Dillabo. I'm a type two diabetic and a sugar addict. And I discovered both of those things over this journey of the last five years. And I'll try and keep this brief, but I think it's really important for you to understand my motivation for doing what I do. A little under six years ago, my whole life crashed. I had a very profitable, thriving business. I was driving a new car. I was living in a very exclusive apartment complex um, with all the amenities you could ever want. I was traveling all over the country, helping people and doing things. And I was giving a lot of my time into my business, working often 12 hour days, but I was happy. Things were going well and I had pretty much everything anybody would ever want out of life. And then the bubble burst on the real estate market. And when that happened over a six week period of time, I literally watched business after business after business go under and went from all of that that I had to sleeping on other people's couches because I'd been evicted from my apartment and losing everything that I had in storage because I had literally zero income. I went from doing really well to zero income over a six week period of time. Obviously that was a big blow it was a really horrible time for me and an awful lot of people that I knew who went through this, basically the same thing that I did. But I had no safety net in terms of savings or anything like that at that point. And um, what little bit of savings that I had went to pay off debts um, that I had accrued in the course of my business. So there I was. I went to live with my daughter for a little while and then lived with my sister-in-law for a while. And while I was at my sister-in-law's house, I tripped and fell. Um, not a big deal, didn't really injure myself except for I bruised the bottom of my foot because the reason I tripped was there was like, they had been doing some renovations in their house and there was a broomstick that I couldn't see in the, in the hallway. So I stepped on this broomstick and my foot rolled across it and my feet went out from underneath me and down I came. Well, the process of my foot doing that, it got seriously bruised. But what I didn't know 
is there was a small break in a callus that I had on my foot and it got infected. Within, within 48 hours, my foot started to turn black. I went to the emergency room. They saw that I didn't have any health insurance of any kind. And they promptly said, well, you know what? Um, this foot is really, really bad. What we're going to do is we're going to give you some antibiotics and send you home. Please take the antibiotics and soak your foot, which I proceeded to do. But within 24 hours, the foot was worse. So I went to a different emergency room um, who looked at my foot, checked my temperature and all that kind of cool and lovely stuff and said, oh my goodness, you should have been on intravenous antibiotics as soon as this started to happen. This was Thanksgiving Day. I was ambulanced from Carthage, New York to Syracuse, New York, which is about a two and a half hour drive in the ambulance. They got me there, um, stuck me on IV, and proceeded to do all kinds of tests. One of the things that they did was um, blood panel, which basically tests everything, including something called your A1C. The A1C is a measurement that measures your blood sugar levels over a three month period of time. And uh, I won't go into the technical information of how they're able to do that, but a, a normal A1C is six. Mine was 14.3. The doctor who came in to the hospital room to give me this news, along with the news that they were going to have to amputate my big toe, uh, told me that he didn't understand why I wasn't in the hospital in a diabetic coma, because that meant that my blood sugars were in the 600 plus ranges. Now, normal blood sugar is between 80 and 120. So 600 is, uh, and higher is very dangerous, and I had been doing that for a three-month period of time. Needless to say, I was devastated. I lost my big toe and proceeded to try and get on with my life. They handed me a testing kit, taught me how to use it. They handed me insulin, put me on what's called a sliding scale, taught me how to do that and how to give myself shots, and they sent me off to do whatever I was going to do. In the meantime, I had been approved for VA medical care, and the VA took over um, my medical care. Understand that the VA is a very overcrowded system. It's medical care, but not always of the highest level. And I've seen that there are differences depending on where you are as to how that medical care is provided. But at any rate, I made another transition, moved back to my daughter's house in North Carolina and proceeded to try and recover from this, all of this, um, having a, an open wound on my foot because when they amputate a toe, they don't just stitch it right back up. They have to leave the wound open and it has to have constant care so that it can heal from the inside out. As it it uh, turns out that they didn't get all of the infection and I ended up losing the rest of my toes over about a three month period of time after the first surgery. So there I am with no toes on my right foot and an open wound on my foot and trying to deal with diabetes and trying to get my head around it um, and feeling very discouraged, I guess is the best word for it. Um, I was tired all the time. I was uh, um, being given high levels of different kinds of antibiotics. They had to keep switching the antibiotics because my system would get sensitized to them and I would start throwing up and all of that. Matter of fact, I spent um, an additional week in the hospital besides the um, two surgeries, which each time was about two weeks in the hospital because I got so dehydrated from throwing up because of the antibiotics that I got vertigo 
um, passed out a few times and actually ended up passing out in the shower and cracking my tailbone. So things were pretty bad. I was very blessed because my daughter basically cleared her one of her kids out of his room and put him in with the other two boys so that we could have a room in her house. And my husband was taking care of me um, 24-7. And my daughter and son-in-law were extremely gracious uh, in taking care of me. And my husband, who is epileptic and who, because of the stress, was also having issues with his seizures. So it was a really dark time. I can't explain to you how devastated I felt because I had been extremely independent all my life. My husband and I had never really thought in any way, shape or form we'd ever find ourselves in this situation. And neither one of us could work. And so in the meantime, I started recognizing the wide reaching consequences of this diabetes. I lost my eyesight for the most part. Um, I went through laser surgery after laser surgery on my eyes because of retinopathy. My digestive system was turned inside out. I was um, dealing with constant diarrhea interchanged with constipation. I lost my ability to be able to balance or to walk without support. Matter of fact, most of the time I was just in the wheelchair, except for around the house, which I got around the house by basically holding on to things. I had to deal with learning how to walk again, uh, because when you don't have any toes on a foot, your toes are what help you to balance. The other issue I had was severe neuropathy, both autonomic and peripheral neuropathy. Autonomic neuropathy is the part that causes the balance issues and the issues with my digestive system and peripheral neuropathy. Now, peripheral neuropathy in diabetic means that you have no feeling or little feeling in your feet and oftentimes your hands, which actually happened with me. Um, I have very little feeling in my pinkies and typing on the computer, that can be an issue. I'm, I'm a very inaccurate typer these days. I do a lot of editing. But the other thing that happens with um, peripheral neuropathy is something called neuropathy pain. Neuropathy pain, the only thing I can liken it to is if you took um, ice pick and you electrified it and you had someone all just randomly jabbing you with that instrument that it's a shock and a, and a very sharp pain and it happens randomly. Sometimes there's a rhythm to it but most of the time it's just zap and then it waits a while and, and, and basically usually by the time I get relaxed from that zap a new zap comes along. This can be very difficult to deal with because it's not like a pain in your head or something where you can take Tylenol or ibuprofen for it because it's not this kind of long-term pain. It's this kind of ninja pain that just crops up. And so in order to fix that, the only thing that they were able to do is something called gabapentin and gabapentin makes you sleepy and foggy in your brain. So what I decided, what I determined was that I would only use the gabapentin at night so that I could sleep, but the rest of the day, I would just deal with it as best I could. We laughed at it because I told my husband one time that it was be like being nibbled to death by a duck. So we started calling it my ducks. So I had duck attacks instead of neuropathy attacks, which is kind of funny and silly. Um, a little bit of dark humor, actually. But any rate, so moving on, this is what I was dealing with. Diabetes is a disease that eats you alive. It just does. It affects everything in your body. It affects your brain. 
it affects your eyesight, it affects your breathing, it affects your ability to heal, it affects your digestive system, and diabetes is very difficult to control. Now, a nutritionist will tell you that if you follow their plan, your diabetes will get better. Your friends will tell you, oh, well, if you just stopped eating sugar, it would fix it. Neither one of those are actually true because diabetes is affected by a lot more than what you put in your mouth, for one thing. And it's not just about sugar. That being said, I just was starting to cope with the diabetes and I got breast cancer and went through all the radiation treatments and everything. So now I had diabetes on top of breast cancer. And anytime you get sick with something else in diabetes, it affects your diabetes. It raises your blood sugars and no matter what you're doing, you're just gonna have problems. So went through all of that, went through the radiation treatment, slept for six months, and finally started coming out of that. There came a point where I said, you know what, I'm through with this. There's got to be something out there that will help me fix this because I'm not willing to be in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. I'm not willing to feel constantly sick. I'm not willing to end up blind and unable to see and do the things that I love and to see the faces of the people I love. I'm not willing to be tortured constantly by neuropathy pains. And so I started to research because I have to say that my healthcare providers were of very little help in this. And I have to tell you that even with the finest healthcare that there is, diabetes is a patient managed disease. Your doctors can't fix it for you. There's no magic pill. There's no surgery you can undergo. Diabetes is a killer. And you don't usually die of, quote, diabetes. You die from the complications due to diabetes. The diabetes just m makes each one of those complications worse and worse over time if you don't do something about it. So that being said, I decided to educate myself and learn as much as I could about my condition. So I started going on to scientific sites, the Mayo Clinic, alternative medicine, doctor's blogs, diabetes association, the other foundations out there that do diabetes research and so forth. So I bought books. Finally, I found a book it's by Dr. Mark Hyman. It's called The Blood Sugar Solution. And I will put a link along with this podcast to help you find that book easily. The Blood Sugar Solution changed my life. I am so grateful to Dr. Mark Hyman for his role in teaching me what I needed to know. But I was, like many diabetics, in denial it took a while for it to sink in that I needed to make some radical changes. And so the first radical change that I made was I got off sugar. Well, guess what? I did. It was hard. It was very hard. Sorry. I went through real torture. And now I really begin to understand why it's so hard for people to quit smoking or drinking or doing drugs my body really wanted that sugar. I persevered and I beat it. That's 16 months ago and I am sugar free. But let me tell you, it was a process. I read every single label. We got rid of all the processed foods that we were eating. We gave it away to people who wanted it. We changed uh, so many things. But what I discovered was getting off sugar didn't fix my diabetes. So that's a lie. But here's what it did do for me. It got me started. It 
did lower my blood sugars. Okay, don't get me wrong. It got better, but it didn't fix it. And then I came to the realization that I needed to go all the way. And that meant replacing all the bad foods that I was eating, all the processed foods that I was eating, and starting to eat a healthy, natural lifestyle. Tracking my carbs, tracking what different foods did to my body. I used my body as a laboratory to get myself healthy. I discovered that there are certain foods that are considered healthy for you that my blood sugars react to very badly. And other foods that surprised me, for instance, a sweet potato. Now, first of all, I didn't used to like sweet potatoes because they put all that gunk on it, you know, the brown sugar and the marshmallows and the blah, 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 blah. Okay. But I discovered that I really do like sweet potatoes. And they don't affect my blood sugars as badly as a white potato does. But I didn't know that before. And none of the books taught me that. I taught myself that. I started tracking everything that went into my mouth, recording my blood sugars, recording how I felt, taking notes about what my day was like as a diabetic, taking note of how my carbs worked, all of those kinds of things. And that changed my life. In December of 2013, my blood sugars were 8.9. Way better than 14.3, but not even close to where I needed to be. In August of that same year, after changing all of this, my blood sugars went down to 6.9. As of my last checkup, about a month and a half ago, my blood sugars were 6.6. Now, 6 is normal. 6.6 is what they call pre-diabetic. My goal is to get my blood sugars down to six and it's gonna happen by my next appointment. But let me tell you what's going on with me now. They have taken me off my earlier sliding scale. I only have to take a shot if my blood sugars go over 150. What that means is in the last two weeks, I've only had to have a shot four times compared to taking a shot three times a day. A month and a half ago, I joined a gym. We've been going to a gym, the gym on a regular basis and I've lost two inches of my waist and I've lost 15 pounds so far. A shout out to the Columbia Basin Racquet Club for their wonderful support in helping me learn how to fix some of my physical issues. I'm really grateful. Also, a shout out to my friend Judith Stevens while I'm doing that, um, and uh, Tanya Mae Reeves, and Vera Martin Duncans, and um, all of the people in my family and all of my friends on Facebook who've been cheering me on with all of this. So that's my story. Now, why do I think this is going to be beneficial to you? Because you need to know that diabetes is a danger to you. Right now, about one third of the adults in the United States are either diabetic or pre-diabetic. That's a time bomb waiting to go off. And the largest amount of spending in healthcare is spent on type 2 diabetes and the resulting complications. It's becoming a leading cause of death, not because of diabetes itself per se. You know, you don't have, generally speaking, people don't die in a diabetic coma very often, but diabetes eats you alive. It causes all kinds of terrible things to happen in your body, heart attacks and um, blood sugar dropouts because of you can die if your blood sugars go too low and diabetics swing back and forth between high and low blood sugars. It's a real problem. It's a real big issue and it needs to be addressed. One of the reasons people become 
diabetic. Not the only reason, I need to be very clear about that, but one of the reasons that people become diabetic is because of the way we eat. People drink their calories these days, um, all kinds of sugary drinks. People don't know how much sugar is in everything that they eat, from the cereal that they eat in the morning to the wonderful bottled sauce they put on their spaghetti at night, the juice that they drink, and so forth and so on. So you need to be aware that sugar is a dangerous thing. One of the things that happens in a diabetic is sugar accumulates in the bloodstream. And those sugars attach themselves to the cells in the blood. And they become like little, I don't know, like those little round shuriken, I'm probably mispronouncing it, things that they use, the ninjas use, that's got the little points all over it. And what it does is it shreds the insides of your um, blood vessels and arteries and creates scar tissue in there that builds up over time. And you can't, it's not something you can get rid of. It's just, it's going to be there. So that leads to things like high blood pressure. It's not just your blood vessels, but your heart. It's tearing you up, literally tearing you up inside. Okay. So you need to pay attention to what you're putting in your mouth. Start with sugar. Sugar is an addiction in the American diet because we have gone from eating 10 pounds of sugar in a year to eating 10 pounds of sugar in a month or more. All right, so we need to get control of this. We are causing an epidemic in our country. When you read The Blood Sugar Solution by Mark Hyman, you will learn some things that's going to shock you. Why are you here? Why are you listening to this right now? You are listening to this right now because you are beginning to realize that what you're putting in your mouth is making you sick. You wouldn't be in this group if you didn't have a really strong suspicion about that and if you weren't already struggling. Judith Stevens told me just yesterday that she is now sugar-free and it's because of this group and the information that we have been providing. If you decide to go sugar-free, I want you to know that this support group will be here for you. And I will continue to offer it on a conference call line, but if nobody shows up for the conference call, I'll recognize that, hey, you know, you're busy, all of that, I get that. And we'll just do it as a podcast. And I'll just record it. So I'll go on there every Saturday at 9 o'clock and wait for people to show up. And if you don't show up, I'm not going to hold it against you. But then I'm going to get on my recording line and I'm just going to go ahead and record it for you. Because you need this. Some of you are type 2 diabetic. Some of you are what they call pre-diabetic. You're looking for answers. We're not going to just cover getting off of sugar but we will be covering all the techniques and tricks that I used to get off sugar completely and how I stay off sugar. But I want you to recognize that you can do it. I hear people all the time. I have people tell me all the time, Bonnie, I know you're all excited about being sugar-free and stuff, but I couldn't do that. I don't have the willpower you have. It's not willpower. It's resolve. It's drawing a line in the stand and saying, you know what? I'm not going to continue to hurt myself anymore. I'm not going to do this anymore. You have to make a decision. It's your choice. And you're not a bad person if you don't get to that point right now. It took me a long time to figure it out. And even when I knew what I needed to do, I didn't get to it right away. It took me three months to say, okay, all right, I get it. I'm going to do it, and I'm not going to look back. And that was after five years or more of denial. 
even though somewhere in the back of my head I knew I needed to do this. So, no judgments. But we're going to give you some tools over the next however many weeks it takes to let you get and stay sugar-free. I love you all for what you are trying to do with your life. I respect that. And I recognize that it's not easy. But we're going to get it done. We're going to get it done together. Your homework is to do this. I want you to picture yourself in a bathtub. The water is just the right temperature. Maybe you've got some candles, some scented candles lit. Maybe you've got a really lovely bath oil in the bathtub. Close your eyes and picture that. The music is soothing in the background. The lighting is calming. You're feeling peaceful. You're feeling content. The water feels like being in the womb. As you sit there and you soak in this wonderful atmosphere, you begin to think about how you want to move forward in your life. You begin to think about all of the good things that you've done for yourself and other people this week, all of the times that you've reached out to help a friend, I want you to picture the faces of the people you love and who love you, picture them smiling at you. your stomach. Let your face go loose. Untense your legs. Wiggle your toes. Now, deep breath. Now, your mental command you are going to drain that bathtub and as you drain it I want you to feel the water pulling all of the tension out of your body it's pulling all of the sadness all of the intensity all of the hurt from your body. It's pulling and it's going down the drain. All of that tension, all of that stress, it's just going down the drain. Just feel it pulling at you. Pulling all of the tension. Feel it coming from your 
your shoulders, through your torso, through your legs and out the bottoms of your feet. And as it pulls the tension out of you, you feel light, warm, soft, light, glowing, starting from your head. Just filling you up. It's filling up your legs and your calves and your feet. And now you feel filled with light. You're comfortable. You're at peace. I'm going to take this part of this recording out of the recording and place it as a second audio file that you can play whenever it's just getting to be too much. Take the minute or so that it takes to do this and just every day reward yourself maybe a couple, two or three times a day with this instead of rewarding yourself with food. You need to stop making food your reward. Oh, I did that so well. I'm going to have a cookie or I'm going to eat fill in the blank. If you're eating to reward yourself, you're reinforcing a bad habit no matter what it is you put in your mouth. Do not use food as a reward. That is your assignment this week. Reward yourself with calm and peace and a feeling of warmth and happiness. Replace that with your food cravings. Start with yourself, but remember, your family eats the same things you do. And the things you're eating affects them as well. Okay? Get it? Got it? Great. We're going to see you next week on the sugar-free How Sweet It Is call. And I'm hoping that some of you will choose to actually participate on the conference line. If you have any questions, leave it in the comment below. Thank you. Have a great week, and I'll see you next Saturday. Bye-bye.